Welcome to the San Diego Opera Podcast. I'm Nick Ravellis, the Director of Education and Outreach. Today my guest is Morgan Smith, baritone, who's going to be singing the role of, Cap of Starbuck, not Captain Starbuck, but First Mate. First Starbuck, Mate Starbuck, yes. Uh, on the Pequod in our production of Moby Dick. Welcome. Thank you. Good to have you with us. Good to be here. Um, I notice on your bio you're doing an awful lot of work in Leipzig, and then I heard you use the word fest. Yes. You, you are then, a, you have a fest contract at Leipzig Opera? I do, for the remainder of this season. Yeah, uh -huh. I've been there for three years. Can you tell our audience what that, what that entails or what it is? Sure. Um, a fest contract is something that exists in the opera world in Germany. Um, it does not exist really here in the States. It's basically a salaried position where you're paid monthly rather than per performance as a guest. Uh, and um, get a monthly salary, benefits, um, do anywhere from, I would say, 25 or 30 performances to about 50. I usually do about uh, 25 to 30 during the season. So that's not too horrible. I mean, no. in terms of in terms of the I've, number of performances, it's not overwhelming for you. No, no. I mean, I've had it. I've had it pretty easy. Um, naturally, with with that lower number of performances, it's easier to get out to do things such as Moby Dick with San Diego Opera. Right. And and how did you how did you get that contra contract? I, I think some of our young singers who are out there trying to make it would would be interested in hearing the story of, of how you ended up there. Yes, well I'm sure uh, if there are other singers listening to this out there, I'm sure I'm not the first one who was told that in order to really make it in the opera world you need to cross the pond, you need to go to Europe um, and establish yourself there as well. Um, not only for um, experience, but also in a way you're often taken a little bit more seriously when you come back here to the States. Right. So you kind of up the ante, you, you up your status, as it were. Um, and frankly, on a practical level, there's nothing quite like um, singing German in a German house and being accepted by a German audience. Then you know you've, okay, I'm, I'm getting it right. <laughs> um, so I headed over there for an audition tour in spring of 2009, uh, in part because I, I didn't have enough work immediately. Uh -huh. um, I had some, some engagements scheduled for future seasons, but I was thinking, well, you know, I've been lucky so far. I've had steady work until this point in the States. Maybe now it's a good time to go over to the Europe, Europe and, uh, and try my hand over there. And, um, I did an audition tour over there, sang for about seven companies. Um, when I got to Leipzig, I knew something was a little bit different with that audition because they asked for one aria, they asked for another aria, they said, okay, can you take a break and come back and sing a third? I said, okay. Well, that's always a good sign. That's <laughs> always a good sign. Um, and then after I finished that third aria, they said, can you wait please till the end after everyone's gone? And um, at the end of all of the auditions, they asked if I did Barber, did Figaro mm -hmm. in Barber Seville by Rossini. I said I had done it before, I hadn't done the role in a little while. Um, they said um, that I should, they requested that I go up into a uh, practice room and work with a pianist and just someone who was on the music staff just to uh, kind of go through the role and that they were comfortable, that I was comfortable. They said that they were losing a baritone for that season and that um, if they were to need me, they would need me right away. So mm -hmm. long story short, um, I went to do a Carmen in Fort Worth, not knowing whether I had to pack a bag for Germany <laughs> or not. And I just kind of did pack the bag for Germany and I got the call and had to essentially move to Germany on six weeks notice. Wow. Wow. Well, now let's talk about uh, Moby Dick. How did the um, how did the role come your way? It's a very interesting story. Um, I lived in Seattle for six years. I was first in the Young Artist Program in Seattle for two years, and then started to get work with the company. By the way, that yes. is my phone ringing. We're going to ignore it. It's okay. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> sure. I had the uh, the good fortune of doing uh, eight roles uh, in operas over over eight years in Seattle. Uh, during that time, I also made some connections with smaller musical organizations, and one of those was uh, Music of Remembrance, which is run by a lady named Minna Miller. Mm -hmm. um, the first project I did with them was the um, Maurice, 
Joyce Sendak Tony Kushner adaptation of uh, Brundabar. Oh yes. The children's opera yeah, from the yeah. Terrazine concentration camp. Right. And had a wonderful experience doing that. And Minna wanted to commission a work that illuminated the struggle of gay victims in mm -hmm. the Holocaust. And she enlisted Jay Kegi to do that. Um, they had initially a tenor in mind, uh, and that didn't end up working out. And then she gave Jake a call and said, you know, I've got this young baritone who I'd really like you to consider working with. I'm going to fly him down. You guys can meet, and you tell me what you think. Mm. So flew down, met Jake, uh, spent about two and a half hours uh, making music together. Uh, he got a sense of what I could do, um, and he called Minna after the trip and said, yeah, sure, I'd love to write this piece for Morgan. And um, it ended up being a chamber, I would call it a dramatic chamber work. Mm -hmm. um, piano, quintet, piano, uh, cello, violin, flute, clarinet, baritone, and actor. Mm -hmm. And we ended up enlisting the, the late uh, Julian Patrick um, oh. to do the acting role. You know, wonderful baritone yeah. uh, in his own right. And um, I had a, was really grateful to get the chance to, to get to know him and to develop a, a wonderful friendship. And what a great story. I mean, I, I, we, we spoke about this just a little bit at the, uh, the meet and greet when you arrived mm -hmm. for Moby Dick. Uh, about paragraph 175. Yes. Is that right? And, and the wonderful documentary about the gentleman, you know, who lived through that and, and reminisces about it. And I guess the, the text of the of the piece is, is drawn from his memories. Is that right? Yes. Um, what they did is they took uh, Jake, Jake Heggie and Gene Shear. Gene, right. Gene, of course, being the, uh, the librettist for Moby Dick mm -hmm. as well and, and many other works. Uh, of, of Jake. They collaborated on many other works. Um, paragraph 175 consists of interviews of survivors of the Third Reich and the Holocaust, um, gay survivors. And what they did is they took one relationship, um, God Beck, who's in one of these survivors, uh, one of the main interviewees mm -hmm. um, from the movie, and they focused on the relationship between him and his deceased lover, Manfred. Manfred, Manfred right. Manfred Leben, mm -hmm. who died in Auschwitz, was murdered in Auschwitz at age 19. And it was really, a, really an interesting way to set it up. They took this relationship and instilled stories and information from these other interviews into this relationship. Mm. Um, so that for the audience, you had a tangible uh, dramatic situation between two people, and yet all the information from all these other interviews uh, could be shared through that vessel really, right. for the right. audience. And I think it worked extremely well, continues to work uh, extremely well dramatically. Um, That's terrific. And uh, yeah, Jake has written so many pieces that are uh, in, in, in such a wonderful way of the moment. Yes. You know, I mean, they, they work for audiences today and right now. Yes. And, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about Moby Dick. It may be based on a book that was published in 1851, but the the themes and the issues that are dealt with uh, in the in, in the book and in consequently in in the opera are are today's issues. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's really the most dramatic conflict of interest you could imagine between between Captain Ahab and and Starbuck and his crew. Mm -hmm. um, his crew, the crew doesn't know it, of course, but Starbuck knows it. Um, and of course, parallels can be drawn between uh, the discussions that are going on right now about the the role of government. Yeah, you know, exactly. Um, role of well, but, but this was a, this was the discussion in 1851, yes, right? Yes. I mean, it, you know, it's okay. It's the ship of state, you know, the Pequod. Yeah. Um, and it's it's it, on this expedition, this adventure to God knows where, the country is about ten years away from splitting apart, and everyone knew it. You know, there's this huge crisis in the country over slavery, uh, and and uh, Melville himself was touched, you know, very deeply by it, and and, and quite personally, yeah. his father-in-law. Uh, being the judge who was one of the northern judges who had to go by the law and say, 
we must return slaves um, who somehow got out of the South or, or were released somehow, we have to return them to their owners, which was just abhorrent to everybody in the North. But, you know, and it was his own father-in-law that had to make that judgment. Um, it, it makes Melville so prescient, you know, but again, the parallels to today are, are just unbelievable. Yeah, and I'd only added, yet, yet while on those ships, oftentimes, um, many sailors of color, this was the, the first chance that they were treated, first opportunity for them to be treated as equals, oftentimes, yeah, you know, right. every man had his duties, you'd be in a boat with someone, and you relied on, on yeah. the person next to you, uh, oftentimes, your life depended on, on the degree to which you could trust the person right next to you, yeah. so... And Starbuck is the one character in, in both in the story and in uh, the opera who isn't dazzled by Ahab's personality and his obsession. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit a bit more about the the conflict between these these two characters. Well, um, as in the book, uh, in the opera Moby Dick, the conflict is is present from really almost from the downbeat, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, there's a line, um, Captain Ahab was it not Moby Dick that took off thy leg. Ahab is starting to to rally the the crew around the, this purpose, this purpose to hunt down Moby Dick. And um, he didn't necessarily want that information to be mm -hmm. shared. He didn't want it to seem like this is some vendetta, even though it is. <laughs> That's Clearly, exactly what it is. To Starbuck. <laughs> so Starbucks starts to kind of, yeah. you know, he's, he's not holding back. He's going to speak his mind. And he is, he is motivated by his responsibility to the crew, to the men as, as the second in power, being responsible for the lives of all of these men. Not to mention the stockholders are sitting back yes, in, in of course. Nantucket yeah. waiting for the oil yeah. to come home. Moral responsibility, financial responsibility, familial responsibility. Mm -hmm. He is someone whose brother and father had perished at sea, and he's trying desperately to, to end that legacy. He speaks often of his, of his wife and his boy at home, mm -hmm. and through Starbuck you really see this mm -hmm. connection, um, even though they're at sea. And during the opera, in particular, nobody nobody sets foot on land. You still have this this ever present element of, of Nantucket you know, mm -hmm. somewhere there on the horizon, mm -hmm. um, and and Starbuck, and many other sailors also want to get back there. Um, but uh, but yeah, the conflict it really really drives the opera, and that's what makes it so fun for me. Um, this role is so important to to that energy, to that drive of the story, and. Uh, and I got to tell you, there's nothing quite as exhilarating as getting to to argue on stage with with Ben Ebner. Yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that ain't half bad. <laughs> exactly. I, uh, I I'm going to have the opportunity to interview him as well, and and uh, you know, as somebody who's just been in love with that voice yeah. for many many years, to finally have him here in San Diego singing the singing a role that was written for him is just is really spectacular. Yes. But, you know, for all of you, uh, because all of you except uh, Jonathan Boyd, the tenor who's singing the role of mm -hmm. Greenhorn, did the premiere. Mm -hmm. We're in Dallas. I was in Dallas to hear one of those performances. Mm -hmm. You were wonderful, mm -hmm. I just you. have to say. I mean, I, what was really exciting for me, and I want you to perhaps just say a few words about it, you get to end the first act yes. with this spectacular Aria. It's one of the most powerful uh, arias by an American composer that I've heard in a long, long time. It's it's really, really beautiful. Uh, but tell us a little bit about that piece. Well, I was struck when I first I I was struck by many things when I first looked at it on the page, and and I mean it continually surprised me and delighted me as I as I went on to actually sing it in rehearsal and everything. I was struck with how how much it was really tied to what was perfectly perfectly timed dramatically what mm -hmm. was going on. Mm -hmm. Um motivically that it was not it was not trying 
self-conscious in some self-conscious way to be a showstopper. You know, right. it was a natural flow. It, it belongs to the natural flow of what's happening plot-wise, what's mm -hmm. happening motivically, musically in the piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, it's very organic. It, it comes is. right out of the motives that he's built up to that point. Extremely organic. And, and it's so personal, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, here Starbuck is, is really illuminating these central themes to the whole struggle and to the whole plot of the piece, and yet this is this very personal moment. He, he comes across Ahab asleep, you know, dis defenseless, basically. Um, really invading his personal space, mm -hmm. but also um, stepping away from who he is morally and, and picking up this gun and actually this musket and, and really considering ending this now for the sake of, of the crew, for, for the sake of seeing his family again. He of course realizes he would get, he would be strung up, um, you know, he would be executed mm -hmm. if, if, if he were to do that. And it's this royal conflict and yet at the same time as a performer I was also aware of the fact that Jake had handed this this gift to me, mm -hmm. <laughs> this, you know, this silver platter, and it's just, and I, I'm so grateful for that, for that responsibility, you know, mm -hmm. um, that dramatic responsibility and, and musical responsibility to yeah. really take the audience, everyone who's experiencing this piece, into into the intermission and and to have that that thrust into the rest of it. But in a, of the and in a thoughtful way, not in a big splashy way. Yes, yes, and I have you know. to tell you, um, a lot of that credit goes to Leonard Folia. Um, the director. Yes, yes. And we as opera singers, as I'm sure if there are many opera singers listening to this now, are aware that we feel often we have to go kind of in opera mode and mm -hmm. always be singing downstage. And and uh, we joke about it in rehearsal, you know, when he's like, you're doing opera man, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, for all of us. And, uh, and um, Jonathan Boyd has also mentioned that to me in this in, in his process, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. And we <laughs> we we uh, had to learn right away in the last the last time we did the production. Um, he really encourages us to be to to um, work our singing actor chops. Yeah, you know? to be an and, actor. Mm -hmm. And that moment in particular um, works best if it's really intimate and personal. Right. And speaks more loudly in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's just the wheels are turning and this process is happening in Starbucks mind and then there's this desperation when he realizes he really is alone in this moment mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that something that you can imagine or maybe you've already done it applying to a traditional role you know like this a Mar experience Marcello or, or yeah or, um, I have I have a little bit yeah you mean the, the the learning experience with with Lenny in this yeah, process, yeah. applying it, yeah, exactly, and 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 bringing it down. In other words, and, and, and being the actor rather than yeah, being the opera guy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, you know we really crave those experiences where we're not just going through the rep, we're not just going on automatic pilot. That we are working with with singers, with directors, with choreographers, with with people who inspire us, who you know. From whom we learn mm -hmm. something new, something mm -hmm. that we're able to apply, yeah. and and that for Moby Dick was huge, huge uh, growth moment for me and learning experience for me, and continues to be. Well, um, I for one am looking forward to seeing it again and again. Now that we're now that we've captured Moby Dick and we have him in, <laughs> in our theater for for performances, yes. and uh, to hearing you again, uh, I'm I'm really thrilled about that and look forward to it. So thank, thank you for you. thank too. you for being with me. My pleasure. All right.